Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation as part of the Industry Insight webinar series. The topic this time is Law Office in the Cloud. Speaking today will be Tomas Siros, Chief Solutions Architect for Abacus Law. As Chief Solutions Architect with Abacus Law, Mr. Siros applies his technical, legal, and business acumen to define business requirements and achieve cloud-based practice automation for his clients. As the spearhead of a global sales engineering team and while working daily with Abacus's client-centric sales team, he defines business, technology, financial, security, and usability solutions for Abacus private cloud, mobile, and legal practice area specific platforms. Mr. Shuros has earned a BA at Tufts University and a JD at the University of California Hastings College of Law as a member of the State Bar of California. In his downtime, he stays active with his daughters and is an avid surfer, triathlete, snowboarder, and scuba diver. Presentation today will be followed by a Q&A. Please enter your questions into the question box in the webinar panel on the right side of your screen. All questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We are recording this webinar and we will be sending the video and a follow-up email in a few days. We will also post the video on our blog at www.lawtechnologytoday.org. Thank you all for joining us. We will now begin the webinar. All right. Thanks, Austin. Um, so quickly, I want to cover what, uh, what the agenda for today. First off, an introduction to the concept of a law office in the cloud. Next, we'll focus on security. Clearly, that's a pressing need. Access one of the core advantages of the cloud, and then management, which really goes to having a technology partner who is man monitoring and hosting and protecting your cloud for you. I will also touch on the advanced technologies that are both inherent as the core competency of a cloud provider, as well as the technologies that are then available to you for mobility, for connectivity, for security, and so on. Finally, we'll also cover cost savings and the concept of not only protecting yourself, but future-proofing um, your firm uh, and your technology, let's say, with a simplified IT management structure. And then we'll touch on cloud preparedness, what, uh, what questions you may need to ask yourself, one, to kind of prepare or to understand your uh, level of preparation. And then finally, some of the questions that I'll share with you that you can use when you're performing due diligence, understanding that there are a lot of different cloud hosts, there are actually a lot of different flavors, that even the term cloud is used and attached to many different technologies. So I'll touch on that briefly as well. And then, as Austin mentioned, we'll have uh, some time at the end for Q&A. And, um, you know, I always, I always love answering specific questions because it really you know, it calls out the need of firms of all size and all practice areas and even all locations. You know, whether you're, you know, a small firm in, in Florida or you're, you know, a firm that has 16 offices across the, uh, the states or the world, there are many ways to leverage the technology that's in the cloud to your advantage. So I'll, I'll focus on that today. Um, and just you know, a little bit of background about me, I've been with Abacus Next, um, and I've worked with Abacus Law, one of our core software programs, for over a decade. And during that decade, I've seen kind of a quantum shift. I've seen technology adoption by law firms evolve from a risk-averse and late adoption mindset to a forward-looking, security-focused uh, embrace of cloud technology and other, other you know, technology uh, opportunities. So, and that really is spurned by the pressing need for security for accessibility, for automation, and communications management, right? So in, in today's webinar, my goal is to grow your understanding of how your law office in the cloud can improve your cybersecurity, uh, your record retention policies, your disaster recovery protocols, want to and simplify your IT management and give you really access to software tools um, that you need, right, to help you provide the services to your client that you would like without a lot of the questions and expense of hardware that is, you know, historically been used to drive or provide those uh, those types of services and that functionality. Um, and you know, to that point, uh, the concept of owning a server, another network hardware that has a you know a limited lifespan that has many points of failure that is maintained by a third party, usually at, at significant cost. That that concept or that paradigm is outdated in many ways. Uh, a law office in the cloud. Uh, gives you peace of mind from having your data and business tools securely managed by a partner who is engaged 24-7, 365, uh, supporting the environment, answering questions, resolving any issues that come up, and helping you grow. Um, that said, that, as my introduction, let's look at a legal private cloud infrastructure. And I wanted to kind of touch on a couple words that we're seeing here. Uh, the legal aspect is uh, the understanding that there are compliance uh, requirements. Right? Law firms are held to a very high standard. Like there's a duty to protect information and to make sure that, you know, you, that any, any client's uh, interests or needs are being you know, monitored, let's say, and protected by you at all times. 
that's really where the legal aspect of a cloud comes in. And so let's take HIPAA, for example. There are encryption regulations where your data is stored geographically. I mean, literally, data centers need to be in the United States. Um, how your communications, your emails are managed, where your data is stored, and who has access to it. Those are just some of the examples of why a cloud needs to be focused for uh, the legal industry, right? So your practice and the requirements, right, the compliance regulations that you, uh, that you must comply with are part of what make a legal cloud different, right? I mean, there can be, there are data centers all over the world. And in many public cloud situations, your data in a public cloud, let's say Dropbox, for instance, can be spread literally in Pakistan, right, in India, in, in Canada, in the United States. That's what a, a, a public cloud really is. It's still the idea of a cloud, meaning your data is hosted on someone else's server and provided to you as needed over the Internet, right? So that's the core understanding of what a cloud is. But a private cloud is different. A private cloud can be designed specifically for any business or industry. But let's talk about, you know, the practice of law. Those specific requirements about where your data is, how it's protected, who or who doesn't have access to it, that is really what, what is the difference. And a private cloud can provide those necessary um, controls and features within, within a cloud environment. One of the core features is the segregation of data. And what that really means is your data, when it's encrypted, is only encrypted within your private cloud. And I keep talking about the private cloud, public cloud distinction. And the difference, I mean, one of the security differences is if a public cloud is breached, all data within that public cloud then becomes, um, you know, accessible to whoever has, has gained access to it. In a private cloud scenario, that uh, segregation of data means that the data in your private cloud is only accessible and is encrypt, but encrypted, I should say, by the keys that are specific to you. So there are significant advantages when, when discussing a legal private cloud because the data within it, the programs within it, the way that you access it, all of that is closely tailored to the needs and the, you know, and the high standards of care that are, that are required within, a, within legal practice areas. Now that said, it still is a cloud, meaning whether you're sitting at your desk at work, logging in using your, you know, your Windows machine, let's say at the desktop, or you're on a laptop and you're traveling, or you're at home, on, you know, and I have an iMac here in my kitchen that I can, I can log into, the, the accessibility, or even my smartphone or my iPad, what, we, what the cloud really gives you is uh, flexibility. You're no longer tied to a location. You're no longer tied to a device. Instead, um, the, that, old, that kind of antiquated, let's, let's talk about that, that paradigm, that whole concept about a server that, host, that house, houses your data, your databases, uh, that can, you know, can share files and distribute applications and things like that and workstation within your network at the office connecting to that server. And then perhaps with a VPN connecting a couple of you know, remote locations depending on kind of the needs of, of your organization. That paradigm is not so different than the way a private cloud designed for a, you know, for a law office operates. However, the entire environment is virtualized and hosted in geographically redundant and mirrored data centers. Right? So at its core, you're, you're, you're getting not only kind of constant monitoring of the environment and a proactive IT kind of management philosophy, but you can access your virtual desktop and all the data and all the documents and emails and, and all the things you may need, the programs that you'll run regularly, um, wherever you happen to be using whatever device you're, you know, you're using at that time. Now, what I recommend also as additional kind of uh, safeguard for specifically for, for law, law firms that are using a private cloud are other tools you can use. So not only strong passwords, changing them regularly, training your staff about what to do or what not to do when you know, they're, they're confused about an email that came in and they're not sure where the origin is and it's telling them to do something this way or the other, or when you're sending out information or giving access to certain things. There are protocols that your, you know, your cloud provider can help you with because those security pro, all, pro protocols, excuse me, that go to the individual level, literally the users of a cloud, are probably the most important way to protect your information. But let's take some technology and apply it here as well, secure passwords and two-factor authentication. And I think of it as like if there's a door, you know, figuratively there's this door that protects access to your cloud, that door has a lock on it, your, your strong password and your username is the first key to the lock, and with two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, your vendor can provide you a second level. It's almost like the deadbolt on the on the door. If we're gonna, you know, gonna stretch that analogy a little bit, 
Um, so those are certain things that I can, I can certainly uh, call out as things that, as, as items that enhance the security while not limiting the accessibility to the environment. And then there are other things that can be done like, you know, not allowing for the copying or the transfer of some documents out of the private cloud or to the public, private cloud. So those are all kind of the, uh, the bits and pieces that when used together effectively and with, you know, with the advice of a, of a security expert can really make this type of environment um, advantageous from a cost perspective, advantageous from a security perspective, and give you the ability to leverage all the current technology and have access to your information wherever you are using whatever device you have, you have handy or you prefer to use. Okay, so that's a lot of words, but I wanted to touch, talk at least give you an overview of the infrastructure of a cloud, of a private cloud, and then a private cloud that's, that's suited or, or tailored for uh, the, the practice of law. Okay. So let's move on to some more details. I do want to give you this quick view of, uh, this is one of the data centers we use. It's just outside of Las Vegas. And you know, it, it certainly is high tech. It's designed, you know, these clearly, these, these, the slide is designed to, to show that off. But there's, you know, it, it, it's, the, it's the concept of comparing this type of facility and the redundancies it has with internet, with power, with fire suppression, with security, and so on. And literally, humans 24 seven that are monitoring the environment and your cloud and you know, the tools that they use to, to make sure that everything is up and running with redundancies and protections. This is something that, I mean, the whole point of this is, one, is, you know, it looks cool, but also um, it, it demonstrates how what we're seeing here is simply not something that a firm, even a, even a, 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 you know, a, a firm of significant size and resources, this is something that far exceeds what a firm could or should really um, create as their own infrastructure. Instead, what you're doing is you're leveraging the expertise of a, a provider, a host, you know, for your cloud that has this type of infrastructure. And of course, you know, uh, in the data center, there are, there's the FBI, there's Coca-Cola, there are these Fortune 500 companies and law firms and so on. And so because of that, uh, you know, the size, a lot, or the volume, let's say, um, you know, everyone can kind of share this, this level of, re these levels of resources and the protections built into them. Okay. So this, so this is, this is an important aspect, the secure access. Now, access is what we really want in the cloud. Everything is protected. It's not, you know, spinning away in a hard drive in our closet. I don't worry about, well, do I have to kind of tunnel in from home to a machine there and then connect to a server here and there, whatever. Instead, what we really want to be able to do is dial in and connect and have a consistent experience. And I, and I describe the consistent experience as your desktop, in essence, right, with all your programs, all your documents, all your emails, and all the tools you need, right? So let's talk about security when, when reaching or, or when, when achieving that access. So the first thing I need to, to stress for you is the encryption. Not only is it a, a compliance regulator, that's something that you must have, but there are two parts of it. When you're accessing a cloud, the security is in the data in transit. And if you think about it, what you're, what you're really doing is accessing your desktop, your virtual desktop, running on a server in one of those high-powered data centers, right? So the, the speed of it, it's optimized, it, it's a good experience. But you want to make sure that your data in transit, meaning the data you send to there, you know, to the uh, to the server, as well as the data you receive from the server, you need that to be encrypted, as well as the data at rest. And it's actually two ways of thinking about the information. One is the information, the data that's actually moving back and forth, and the other one is the documents and you know all other types of data that you have stored in that server in in the uh, the private cloud, right? So encryption of data in transit and at rest are in, are extremely important. And this next kind of aspect or flavor is encryption of email and of your backup, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. There are a number of different ways to have encryption uh, be part of your email exchanges. I like, there are a number of different systems. The one that we use, you can actually choose which emails to encrypt. And, you know, very quickly, what you do is, you know, I send the email, but I don't actually send the, uh, the content of the email. What I do is I send to the recipient or recipients, let's say it's the client, a notification, hey, there's an encrypted email available for you. They then click and access it via secure, uh, you know, a secure channel. And then if they want to respond, they can do it through that same encryption, you know, way. So the good thing is I'm not sending them a lockdown file, right, that that might ca cause confusion or whatnot. Instead, what I do is I send them a notification. Then we both use kind of an online um, encrypted and secure way of communicating. It's still emails. There's still a chain. There's still a record of them. And, you know, we can still send attachments and do all the things that we do regularly with the email. But... The point is the email itself, that notification, and the ability to access it in an encrypted online environment is a, is a is, you know, is a significantly 
advanced way to protect email communications. Um, and another, you know, another advantage is if I accidentally send an email to the wrong recipient, if they don't have the, uh, you know, the, the access controls that, let's say, my client, the intended recipient has, they will not be able to uh, access any of the content in that email. Okay? I touched on multi-factor authentication earlier. That really is, I mean, here's a use case. So what I do is I go and I'm, I'm connecting to my cloud. I put in my username and my strong password. I click connect. My smartphone then buzzes. And it says, you know, Tomas, we, you know, are you, are, is this you? Are you trying to access your cloud? And I literally on screen have a green button and a red button. If I click red, it will, it will you know, it will, it will disable or it will deny, reject that, uh, that connection attempt. If I click green, I then I'm in. So it's really using that smartphone that's always in my pocket as my, you know, my, um, my deadbolt key in order to kind of provide access at a, at a higher level, right? The other thing I want to touch on is the phishing aspect. And uh, I've, got, I've, you know, I've spoken about this a lot in the past, and, and the problem is it's growing. And what uh, hackers and basically just thieves, cyber thieves are doing is they're targeting law firms because they understand that law firms are in business to represent client interests. And they have a very high standard to protect information for the client and about the client and that they receive from the client. Because of that, they're becoming targets because you can send an email to an office administrator in a law firm and say, hey, you know, we're doing a security check. We need you to, to you know, click these three things and, and to make sure that you're, you're safe. That person, you know, with best intentions, clicks on it and downloads a L Locky is an example of one that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Locky is an example of a malware exploit, right? Basically, it's a virus that can be delivered as a PDF with a Word docu document embedded within it with macros embedded into that Word document. So you can, you can receive a message that says, you know, Tomas, uh, we're, we're doing our security check. This is extremely important. We need you to read this PDF and, you know, and click at the bottom to acknowledge that, you know, that, that you've read it. I open that PDF and what it does is puts malware into my computer and then propagates that malware not only to everyone else's computer but also to the server. It then encrypts that entire environment and everyone sees on their screen a locky notification saying, your data is encrypted, we're the only ones who have the key, you have, you know, 38 hours or 48 hours, excuse me, three days, 48 hours to pay us in, you know, $15,000. It's usually, you know, just enough so that, you know, you're, you're thinking about whether it's worth it or not. But I think prevention is the best way, right? So in order to avoid those phishing scams, one, internal training, right? Understanding the protocols. If you're in at any way unsure of what to do next, ask an expert and make sure that your cloud host has 24-7 access. You can pick up the phone, call them, and say, this is odd. Is this from you? Is this from me? What is this? And they'll quickly be able to tell you um, exactly what to do, which is usually delete it and, you know, and good on you for, uh, for asking the right questions. I also wanted to kind of bring up the Panama Papers. That's a, you know, it's, it's a couple years old now, but it was in a, in a situation where a law firm was hacked, literally an old school hack that was tunneling into their server. Terabytes of information were siphoned off over the years. And it created this international scandal, you know. So those are some of the things that are that are coming up. The Panama Papers was not a cloud host in any way. It was a traditional on-site server that was still hacked. So I kind of want to bring that up as, you know, the, the, just to be aware that the, that the phishing specifically, those types of kind of trickery that are designed to uh, to achieve access, no, or, or access just with malware, malware in order to kind of exploit and uh, and encrypt networks. Um, so that's another thing. So that goes to the antivirus, the malware detection, the intrusion detection should be in real time. So proactively, anything that is known as far as kind of anti uh, or as viruses go will be detected immediately and, you know, and blocked. Um, and also, you know, what I truly do recommend is to ask your vendor for an audit of your infrastructure and your protocols and the way you store documents and the way that individuals have, you know, um, ability to share documents. And too often I work with law firms where they've hesitated to move into the cloud, but some of the, you know, some, the partner here, an associate there is storing some files in Dropbox because, you know, either they want it, they needed access to it remotely or a certain client, you know, or, or even a staff at a certain client wanted to be able to kind of collaborate that way. What it really does is create an inconsistent and insecure environment. It really does because, um, you yeah, know, and, and that's why I recommend an audit because finding how people are using it and making sure that there, one is consistency. One, there's just awareness across the firm of, you know, the liability sometimes, you know, the dangers of going with certain um, online or, or, you know, or public cloud ways of storing information. That can complicate things. Um, so the protocols we touched on, making sure there's training and, and an understanding in the firm of how you, uh, how you provide access and how, you, how it's secured. 
And then finally, making sure that your vendor does provide you know 24/7 guardianship of the environment. We will will reach out to you proactively if they you know if they discover something, uh, some anomalous behavior, um, or if they even just catch a you know a virus, they can let you know or, or give you a log or a report uh, regularly. Um, the next slide here I wanted to touch on is advanced technology. Really, so so that's really the upside. I keep you know I don't want to, to belabor the uh, the security aspect. It it is a, it's of essential importance to uh, assessing your you know your your law firm in the cloud, but the upside, the positive is the advanced technology that then becomes available to you, right? And right away, the accessibility. Any device, anywhere you happen to be with internet, anytime you can access your work computer. It's up and running, it's available, it, you know, in many ways it's faster than the machine you're cur currently using, so there's a lot of uh, advantages there. The next one I wanted to touch on, and I, and I briefly mentioned it earlier, and it's the idea of virtual virtualization of the workstation right, the virtual PCs and the network. There's a huge advantage in doing that, and it goes to the next uh, point, which is, should there be a disaster? Imagine a flood, a fire, you know, somebody just comes in and steals things, vandalism, you know, a lot of, many things can happen. But the ability to recover from a disaster, this type of um, environment where you can use any device and your desktop is virtual means that if you, you know, if you're, if you're let's say your laptop dies, that's a real world scenario, you can move to the conference room. You can move to someone else's, you know, desktop, or you know, your provider might give you kind of a, a stripped-down thin client. You jump on that machine. You're exactly where you were. The document's waiting for you, or the email right where you left it last. So it's that concept of being able to, to recover from a disaster because you're no longer tied to a device or a network or you know or uh, or any kind of geographic location, right? And also, business continuity is the is the other side of that coin, where the ability to get back up and running, right? How long will it take you to recover from, you know, a, a, a data uh, energy spike or, you know, a, a flood or fire, those things that would that come up, kind of natural disasters or something else where, you know, you were, you've got a, a, a locky virus. Those are the kind of things where imagine how long it would take you with your IT staff to bring everyone's workstation back up and running with their programs and the licenses for each of those and the data that they had locally and their preferences and so on and all their settings, and the server. Spinning that back up, well, maybe we have to get a new server. How much is it? Where do we go? I get three quotes. They're all like within, you know, there's a $10,000 range. I really don't know who's telling me what. Those are the kind of things where if it's a virtualized environment, a lot of those questions go away because the host, ideally, has created a legal-specific cloud. It's private, it's protected, it's encrypted, and you simply let them know, we have this many users, we have this much data, these are the programs I need, and we can kind of be up and running. And then once you're up and running, you have disaster recovery, and business continuity built into that environment. Uh, the reporting and dashboard, that's kind of a leverage of some of the cloud-based tools that you can use, right? So, you know, either software like Abacus Law that, that, uh, that I'm familiar with has its own dashboard, but the idea of having your data always available to you. So maybe during the course of a business during a week, I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm practicing law, I'm billing hours, I'm, you know, doing whatever, I, whatever my kind of practice is, but on the weekend, I might want to pull up, or on the afternoon or towards the end of the day, I might want to pull up a report for productivity purposes or to prepare myself for the coming weeks or, or you know, even tomorrow. So that business intelligence is something that's built into a lot of the core technologies that are built into the cloud. Um, also mobility, the ability to leverage your smart device. I touched on one aspect, that multi-factor authentication where your phone becomes the second you know, authorization to, to grant access to your cloud, but also the ability to leverage your, the calendar on your phone right, in, a, in an automated real-time way. That's another nice way of leveraging cloud technology because I no longer need to think or worry about, you know, when was the last time I connected here or there, or is this, is, you know, do I have to call and, you know, and I guess making a call is to the next point, which is having your smart device become more of an assistant. So if you send an email, if you make a phone call, if you receive a communication, or if you attend, you know, a hearing or, or whatever, the, whatever the case may be, your smart device is in your pocket. It knows, one, it knows where you are via GPS. It knows your calendar, let's say. It knows, you know, who you've called, who you've emailed, who's called you, and so on. All of that is, in essence, data. That should be something where if you need your device to work with you or for you, you should be able to just roll through the things you've done that day and, you know, bill for this, save this to the file, bill for that, save this, and so on and so on, right? So those are the kind of aspects of leveraging, you know, your smart device you know, more than, you know, for games or, or, you know, the other things that you might use it for. Certainly it's a phone, but it's also a smartphone. So leveraging some of that technology 
knowing that what it's doing is connecting, storing, and sharing information securely with your cloud. I think that's a, that's a significant uh, advancement and we really do use that. Workflow automation is another important aspect and that kind of goes to your calendar, making sure in real time you know exactly what's, what's happening and being able to kind of standardize what happens at the beginning and the middle of the end of a case and all of that stored, secured, and accessible in the cloud and potentially on your smartphone. A client portal is another thing that, that this type of environment can, uh, can help with. A lot of clients like that access to information about the case. And a lot, I'll be, I'll be candid here, a lot of attorneys like the fact that a client can look up information and get a status update or upload information that's been requested or download information that they need in a portal environment where the communication between staff and the attorney and the client um, can in many ways um, not require a direct communication. You know, when that, when that is of an advantage, when that is an advantageous situation, certainly a client portal, um, it can be part of a private cloud, as well as electronic payment, like the ability to make sure that PCI, you know, compliant electronic and credit card processing for your invoices is, uh, is part of the cloud. I think that can be extremely helpful. And the final one is the document management and email management, right? Email has, has increased exponentially, just the volume of it. And we're using email to not only send and receive information, but also document right, to distribute information, those kind of things. You want to make sure that in your cloud you have the storage you need and the ability to access all of the documents, right, whether it's keyword searching of a document. You remember a couple of years ago that we did, you know, that was close enough that we, we can use some of that for this, uh, this situation, or just pulling up a case file and having everything that you, you need accessible to you, whether you're sitting at your desk or you're sitting, you know, uh, at, uh, in court, right? So it's a nice way to make sure you have access to all that information. Final thing I'll touch on maybe is reduced IT costs. And right away, the ability to move from a capital expenditure model where you literally are buying very expensive server hardware and updating it, upgrading it, and having someone else come in and maintain it for you. Uh, not to mention that, but all the workstations. What this environment does is it shifts those expenses over to operating expenses, which you can deduct immediately. And you know if you, you know, when you, uh, when you sign up with a cloud provider that the operating costs are set for the term of that agreement. Right? So there won't be spikes or, un or, or uh, unexpected um, needs from a hardware perspective. So that CapEx to OpEx is an extremely helpful way to make sure that you are understanding your IT spend and in, in many ways, not only simplifying it, but um, you know, avoiding some of the complications that come up down the road where you're working with or you get three quotes, like I was mentioning earlier, and they don't jive. So you, and, you're, and you're not an IT expert. You don't really know where things are coming from and you're relying on outside experts in many ways simplifies your IT, and allows you really to use a lot of the hardware you already have, you know, desktops and laptops, let's say, because the actual processing, a lot of it happens in the server itself. So your computer, right, that you're using, the thing that you're sitting in front of and typing on, that is really just a thin client. So, you know, I would recommend get a nice big screen, have a lot of RAM, but the storage, you're not storing things on that local machine, and God forbid I knock my coffee on top of it, I can very quickly move to another machine, reconnect, and I have, I'm exactly where I was when I left off. You're not as reliant on hardware. Right? Also, I like the proactive versus reactive, where in a reactive mindset, if your server dies, then everyone scrambles and we figure out, well, I mean, did we reboot it? Do we have to replace it? Do we have to replace significant parts of it? That is downtime. That can be extremely disruptive. Or if you're having these you know, occasional glitches, or if you're trying to connect multiple locations through a VPN and it's, it's, it is extremely slow, those are frustrating things that I've heard from a lot of clients that I've, uh, I've worked with. Right? So using kind of the proactive model, you're not needing to replace, right? Or things aren't breaking before you address them. Instead, you're having someone else monitor it 24-7 to make sure proactively that any anomalies are recognized and remedied long before they, you know, they would disrupt your business. And I, I throw out this, this, uh, this number, $3,966 per year is, I think, a recent, a recent uh, industry you know, survey said that that was the usual or the normal IT spend. And uh, it breaks down to, I think, $100 a month per uh, seat. Right? So if you break out all the service co server costs and all the IT maintenance and the, you know, the ways that you, uh, you end up paying to support your network, um, it's important to recognize the actual cost that you're spending um, and the, re you know, the rejection you can get against that cost by moving to a, uh, a you know, an OPEX model. It also mitigates the risk of failures, as I touched on earlier, that active monitoring and support, the proactivity in making sure you have, always have access to the environment wherever you are, whatever device you happen to be using. Those are uh, you know, the proactive. That's the future proofing of your firm because your data, your documents, your programs, even your workstation, you're literally your, your virtual uh, office computer 
is at your beck and call, right? And it's hosted, managed, and secured by, uh, by the vendor. Also, scalability and long-term growth. Like if, a, you know, if an associate leaves, right? Or you hire, or you take on you know, some, some new business, or a couple firms merge, the ability to move from your current environment, let's say you're in the cloud. Okay, we're bringing on five, 10 new, new associates. The ability to spin up their workstation and give them the right permissions, the right access, and the right security tools in a cloud environment, that can be done in a couple of hours, let's say. I mean, it depends, right? It depends on their complexity and the needs. But because they're virtual, the ability to add, in essence, a virtual workstation is much more simplified than having you know, an IT person come in to get a new you know, hardware device, get the right programs installed, get the right licenses. There are just a number of steps that are required in that you know, an older paradigm where the scalability in the cloud is literally, because it's a virtual you know, workstation, we can spin it up very quickly, and it'll have all the permissions and all the security that all the other workstations have. And also that, you know, that supports long-term growth. So you to understand what your cost will be, understand you know, the, the, the simplified IT that you have ma maintained on site, and then of course, you know, um, growing as needed and when needed with a quick phone call to, you know, to, your, uh, to your cloud host, your vendor. And then of course the vendor accountability. And this is something that I talk about a lot, but I hear about it a lot. It's the concept where, well, in our firm we use this you know, case management software, we use that you know, accounting software, our invoicing is done here, we use you know, uh, payroll there, and it's kind of this piecemeal uh, assembly of you know, useful tools. And they all complement each other, and, and in, in some ways they are working as a system that gives you, you know, all the access, or let's say all the, all the tools you need. However, when there's a problem when you know, program A needs to talk to program B, which pulls some information from program C, if I get a glitch, I call A, well, you're going to you're gonna need to talk to C. I call C, they're like, well, you know, what we do is we just talk to B, so you're going to have to call them. And you end up in this, like, unaccountability loop where everybody has, like, well, we do A, B, and C, but what you're really talking about is F, right? What the problem is, you're in the middle of that. So what do you do? There's a lot of frustration, there's disruption, and there's an annoyance factor. When you go with a legal cloud, the host supports the software, uh, not only the software, but the infrastructure. So you call them and you can ask them about hardware or, or what, what seems like hardware, right? Which is, I need a new you know, a workstation spun up for this new associate. Or I need to know why you know, my, my QuickBooks is, uh, is, is not you know, coming online. Or you know, I need QuickBooks put on this new PC very quickly. Those are the kind of things where if you have a vendor who's responsible for your private cloud, all of those answers, all of those issues are resolved for you knowing who to call. And it's the, you know, it's, it's, you look at it two ways. It's the one hand to shake, right, for all the help you need, or the one neck to choke. You're not, you are not put in the middle where all these vendors are basically pointing at each other. Okay? So, some quick legal cloud readiness questions. Uh, do you have multiple offices? Do you have employees that work remotely? Or do you have, you know, or occasionally, or, or that, that travel? Um, something to look at is your office internet bandwidth. So you certainly want to make, make sure you check that too. I, and I recommend one megabit up and one megabit down per user at a minimum. Also your firewall kind of restrictions. Um, also taking a look, like really doing the math and figuring out how much do you spend on your IT monthly. And I think that will help you understand the return on the investment of moving to the cloud with the security and accessibility as, it, you know, as the reasons to do that. Also the age of your server and infrastructure. Servers usually last about four years. Right? I mean, they're kind of timed to last a certain uh, amount of time. And also, you know, you know, technology moves forward. And they're, you know, in a server from four years ago is, runs hotter, right? requires more energy. There's a lot being done, you know, to make them green. And, uh, and you know, uh, so it's, it's interesting. It's an interest, interesting time for you to be able to take a look at your infrastructure currently and understand, well, we may not replace it for two years, right? Or, you know, it, we may end up having, you know, in, within the next 10 months or, or 18 months, a significant need to either replace the whole thing or, uh, you know, whatever the, whatever the case may be. Oftentimes, that's, that's worth taking a look at. Also, do you have outside IT? How much do you pay? Is it per incident? Are there after hours charges? Those kind of things. How much do you pay for your backup? Because oftentimes, backup is integrated. It's an integral part of the cloud. And you get geographic redundancy across multiple data centers, a lot of those advantages. Um, have you suffered a failure of any sort? You know, getting a sense of, well, how long did it take us to recover from that? You know, that, that can be more than just an annoyance. It can literally affect your ability to conduct business and meet deadlines and so on. Have you been hacked? If not, you know, if there's a phishing attempt or, you know, some firms, I think there was a, there was a recent statistic that 40% of firms that were hacked had no idea that they had been hacked. So their antivirus malware, you know, the protections that they had in place 
we were outdated or were simply you know one step behind the ex exploit that uh, that led to the hacking, and then finally kind of figuring out your timeline. You know, is is a quarterly, you know, at the end of the quarter or fiscal year, or are there any kind of natural, you know, well, once we finish this trial, or we're, you know, we know we have some trials coming up, now's the time to do it. Those are the kind of things I would recommend you kind of, you know, sit down and, and think about when you're preparing for a move like this. And then finally, the last one is due diligence. These are some of the questions that I would recommend that you ask your a provider of a legal private cloud to determine their readiness and ability to support uh, your cloud. Um, is it an end-to-end -end hosted IT solution, right? Do you pick up the phone and call them and know 24-7 you will speak to a live person who will be able to respond and answer and, and you know, supply the information you need? Is there zero capital investment? Because the whole idea is you're not buying hardware, right? It's the OPEX model. You're, you're, you're basically doing, having operating costs. I think that's an important aspect. You should not have to buy hardware. Um, the encryption level, in transit, it, at rest, the, the segregation of, uh, of data, the email encryption, those are kind of things that are important to ask about. Also the level of encryption. 256 AES bit encryption is uh, what I strongly recommend. Um, also questions about disaster recovery, business continuity. How long would it take you in the course of a, of a locky, you know, uh, phishing uh, malware exploit, how long would it take you to, to, to bring us back online? Those kind of questions. Do you offer workflow automation or professional services, the kind of consulting that can actually help you imp improve workflow automation within the firm? And what that really comes down to is understanding your best practices, being able to make those a consistent, you know, uh, a series of events that is, that is managed for you by a calendaring system or a case management system or all the other different things that, are, that can be available to you. Can you use any device or can you lock it to certain devices? Are all applications supported, a SQL database, Advantage database? There are many different flavors, SaaS, you know, all the different things that you might use as part of the overall solution, making sure that you can install those and the vendor will support them, update them, and, uh, and make sure you have, you have uh, you know, constant access to them. Uh, the idea of a pay-as-you-grow infrastructure, instead of buying a one-size-fits-all cloud that may exceed your needs in certain elements or a cloud that, that you know, falls short of what you need, or even individually members within the firm might use their technology in different ways. You could have a power user here or a data entry clerk there. Understanding is there enough flexibility in the individual accounts that I can, you know, that I can have, individual cloud accounts, I should say, that I can kind of you know, bring online for, for the needs of each individual in the firm. I think that's an important aspect. And then here's, this one is extremely important. Do you retain complete ownership of data? Not only who has access to it, how it's stored, where it's stored, but what happens if should we, you know, decide to part ways down the road? You know, how will I get my data? How quickly will I get my data? And what are the, you know, what are the policies for deleting any data that was, you know, that was stored on a, on a, a cloud, um, you know, uh, legacy cloud, let's say. So with that, I'll kind of wrap up. Also, the, you know, the 24-7, uh, 365 support is extremely important, right? You're not a technology ex expert. You're not a security expert. You practice law. You should not need to be uh, any of those things except a high-functioning attorney providing the best services to your client. Make sure you go with a vendor that has support, meaning you can pick up the phone and call. It's not after hours you, you, know, you get a recording, or after hours there's a per-incident fee. There are a lot of different price structures like that. Nowadays, you should have 24-7 live support for your cloud understanding that the whole idea, one of the kind of benefits of going to the cloud is you rely on it, you need access to it, and you want access to it securely, and you need somebody who can make sure that they, you know, they, they provide that one and you know, they support it and, uh, and make sure that they, uh, um, it's always up and running and accessible to you.